Hi everyone, I'm Hélène Landemore from Yale University. I'm uh, delighted to be giving this lecture on the occasion of Botorantin's uh, conference on democracy and citizenship in Sao Paulo. I'm very sorry I can't be here in person. I certainly wish I was in Brazil right now. As uh, things stand, I'll be delivering this lecture from Paris where I'm spending the fall semester. So I'm going to talk about open democracy, which is my vision for a more authentic rule by the people. The idea is simply to put back at the center of power the ordinary citizen, return power to people. I'm going to proceed uh, in four steps. First, I'm going to talk about um, what's wrong with representative democracy as we know it because I don't think you can have a solution if you don't have a clear picture of what the problem is. Second, I'll describe the institutional principles underlying this vision of open democracy uh, as authentic rule by the people. And in a third uh, moment, I'll give an example of what open democracy could look like, or at least of a, of a recent success at, um, uh, supports the idea that citizens are actually capable of occupying the center of power, which is for me legislative power, I should say, and so are capable of making the law and thus rule. I'll talk about the French Convention on Climate Change, which is a recent example of such a capacity by citizens to take things into their own hands and write the law. And finally, in a brief concluding moment, I'll explain how uh, building on all these elements, one can envision what uh, an open democracy would look like going forward. So let me first turn to what's wrong with representative democracy. In order to understand what's wrong with representative democracy, let's clarify a few terms and let's clarify first and foremost what democracy means. Democracy means people's power or people's rule, depending on how you translate kratos uh, in the Greek, demos kratos, demos standing for people and kratos for, for power or rule. Another common definition of uh, democracy is the famous uh, uh, definition by President uh, Abraham Lincoln, rule of the people, for the people and by the people. It's a sort of throwaway definition that people use, so let's spend some time unpacking what it really means. Rule of the people truly means um, uh, popular sovereignty. It means that when uh, it comes down to the final say, it's the assembly of the entire people that need to make the decision, um, for example, in an election or a referendum. Uh, when it comes to for the people, what we mean generally is that um, it's a rule that benefits the people. It's in their interests, um, it's good for them. Finally, there's the idea of by the people, which to my mind is the crux of the matter um, and is the idea that it's the people who exercise power. Now, rule of the people, the idea of popular sovereignty, historically has actually been compatible in my view with uh, non-democratic rule. Uh, you take, for example, the Hobbesian conception of uh, the legitimate uh, representative of sovereign it's the people, but they don't get to do the ruling. But who does the ruling for them is an absolute monarch. Same thing in Locke, same thing even in Rousseau. Rousseau thought that, of course, a regime wasn't legitimate until it was uh, consented to by the you know, entire people in, as a unanimous body. But at the same time, by building on a fine distinction between government and administration, more or less, he thought that it was fine to delegate the actual task of what we would call ruling to an aristocracy of uh, bureaucrats, so to speak. So really, to me, uh, the, the crux of the matter is by the people, because similarly for the people is something that can be performed by non-democratic regime. Um, think of China, for example. You could say that um, if you have a sort of idealized vision of what it's accomplished over the last 40 years. It's been lifting millions of people out of poverty, so it's done for the people um, the things that you would want a democracy to do, except it's been done in non-democratic ways. So again, by the people is ultimately the true mark of a democracy. How does that work out today? What do we mean by um, 
ruled by the people or uh, democracy in, in, uh, in contemporary parlance. What we mean by it is something along the lines of the freedom house definition, which is widely used in political science, for example. It's meant to be a political system, a quote, whose leaders are elected in competitive, multi-party and multi-candidate processes in which opposition parties have a legitimate chance of attaining power or participating in power. It's the idea of periodic elections and a peaceful transition from one party to the other, right? Um, so the emphasis is ruled by elected representatives as selected by party leadership, right? So we are meant to believe that rule by such elected representatives is indirect rule by the people. And I want to question that assumption. In fact, if we look back at the history of our, of our existing democracies, they were meant as anything but democracies. They were meant as liberal slash Republican regimes. In fact, often they were meant as mixed regimes, regimes borrowing from aristocratic principles, for example, with the Senate, uh, monarchical principles, for example, the president or a king, uh, and a democratic principle in parliaments and, uh, and various uh, um, outlets for, for popular opinions. So oftentimes, you know, it's said that the Federalist designed a republic, not a, not a democracy. And indeed, if you look at some of the key features, some of them are uh, somewhat um, undemocratic, you might say, bicameralism and the supermajoritarian constraints uh, on the collective will are a way to uh, minimize the, the popular will. Separation of power, checks and balances are also ways in a way to keep the regime uh, mixed and, and uh, 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 not exactly aligned with a pure definition of people's power. You see that tension or that ambiguity, or in fact, that uh, clear commitment to a non-democratic regime in a, a passage from the Federalist Paper in uh, number 63 written by Madison, where he writes that uh, the true distinction between ancient governments or so actual democracies at the time, that's, how they, they, that's, that's what the word democracy evoked for them, and the American governments lie in the total exclusion of the people in their collective capacity from any share in the latter. So basically, our modern representative democracies have as a, uh, ancestors, if you will, regimes that excluded the people in their collective capacity. So how come we call today these uh, uh, non-democratic regimes democracies? Well, in part because, of course, we've expanded the franchise, we've rendered it universal, uh, women are included, the poor are included, there's no longer a, a, a census, if you will. Um, similarly, anyone can uh, run for candidates uh, in theory in uh, modern uh, demo de representative democracies. But the reality is that it took a while for these regimes to be called democracies. For example, um, in France, this is not before 1830, around the time that um, Tocqueville's Democracy in America was published, that um, the word democracy acquires a positive balance and has come to use to describe um, existing regimes. That's true too in the US, roughly the same time this transition uh, happens. It's much later in, in, uh, in the case of Great Britain where uh, the positive balance of democracy ha happened sometimes between 1870 and the First World War. I just read a very interesting dissertation by, by a French scholar named, uh, a Canadian scholar named uh, Hugo Bonin, who says that uh, in a way we can see the domestication of the world democracy, which comes to mean no longer the, the radical direct regime of ancient times, but a liberal Republican construct, uh, a, a mixed regime of sorts in modern times. Again, uh, if you contrast that with the openness and directness of, of access that people had to the center of power in ancient times, where the idea was that you could uh, rule and, and be ruled in turn, it's quite um, uh, it's quite a difference, right? Uh, but it's not just a difference with uh, ancient democracy. You can think back to, for example, um, uh, the 10th century uh, Icelandic uh, parliament, the Alting, that was this open space that uh, anybody could uh, enter to talk about the law. Once a year, they gathered um, to, 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 to basically self-rule. And they had this idea that there was no king except the law. Again, a very distinct um, feeling and spirit than modern representative democracies. One could argue that 
today were not so much ruling and being uh, ruled in turn as mostly being ruled by a professional elite, elective elite. And indeed, look around, where is the people uh, in our modern democracies? If you take the American Congress, perhaps uh, an extreme case, the re-election rate of the, 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 the Congress is over 90%. This is clearly a professional class. Some of these people are saying, Carl, 30 years, it's, it's a job. Interestingly, the approval rate of this kind of Congress hovers around 13%. It has reached a historical low of, of 9%, um, but it's never been higher than 33%. If you think about it, the core of the heart of American democracy, the Congress, has never achieved the approval of even half the population. Most worryingly, in recent years, um, uh, American political scientists uh, Martin Gillens and Benjamin Page have shown that between the late 70s and the early 2000s in the US, there's absolutely no correlation, zero correlation between what the people want and what they get once one controls for the preference of the 10% uh, wealthiest Americans. They don't go that far, but it's very easy to conclude that uh, America has become, if it hasn't always been, some kind of um, de facto plutocracy ruled by the wealthy. So the reality is that if you look, you know, um, at the cold truth is that we are still platonicians. We think that government legislators must be the best and the brightest. They must be um, the, the, the people that we uh, put in place must be the confidence men, the kind of people that uh, Obama surrounded himself when he bailed out the banks, the experts, the technocrats, the lawyers, the people who know stuff, right? And how do we reconcile ourselves with that very expertocratic elitist vision? Well, through normative uh, accounts of representative democracy that make it sound a lot better than it really is in my mind. And I used to absolutely adore um, Habermas uh, public sphere model, and I still think it has enormous uh, normative value, but as a descriptive account of what's going on, I think it's um, uh, too optimistic. So what's uh, Habermas' uh, two-track model of representative democracy? This vision of two um, spheres, uh, concentric spheres, so at the center you have a, a track one, which is a track occupied by elected officials, courts, administrations, that make the decisions, make the law. And around it, you have a much larger, much more anarchical and informal and free sphere of public uh, opinion where public will formation happens, right? Um, uh, sorry, sorry, where opinion formation happens and, and it's supposed to shape the will formation that takes place in track one. The problem with that vision is that, you know, you, there's this idea that um, the communication between track two and track one happens by the parties, the media, associations, uh, unions, and that it all works out to establish a kind of a great match between what the public sphere ultimately wants and what it gets and what the, the, the elected officials and, and the rest of the official system produces, right? The problem is that if it were true, how come we already live, uh, if we already live in democracies that, that are so um, functional, how come we're so unhappy, right? We see it all around, uh, we, especially in recent decades, we've seen crisis after crisis, whether it's Brexit, the Trump election, uh, the return of populists of all kinds, the rise of protest movements like the Yellow Vest in France, um, the Black Lives Matter in, in the US, uh, or the protest in Chile, for example, against neoliberal, uh, against the neoliberal regimes. And, and this speaks to a crisis of representation. In, in a way, the Yellow Vest is particularly symptomatic in my view, because they literally had to put on a neon yellow garment to, to say and express how invisible they felt and how much they wanted to be seen and recognized in the system. So, um, why is it that you can't, um, why is it that we, we don't have democracy for the people anymore, or if we ever had it? I think that's where uh, I propose an interpretation which, which has uh, hopefully some merit, which is that democracy as we understand it is fundamentally flawed. It's actually something that the Greeks told us all along in that uh, recent scholarship as, as, um, as it's repeated over and over again. Elections distribute power unequally. They are not a way to select 
rulers that is uh, fundamentally democratic, in fact, it's oligarchic. And the problem is that um, when you have uh, an unequal distribution of power at the top, especially when it comes to the legislative power, you end up not only with massive conflict of interest over time, as these rulers form a separate class with their own interests. To me, the most important problem is, in fact, that even barring the conflict of interest, you end up having enormous blind spots. And, I, and as I said, I think the, the Yellow Vest movement is a perfect um, embodiment of that problem. They got forgotten. Why? Because the people who got to power through elections were urban, educated, upper middle class um, people who did not understand the meaning of an uh, increase in the eco tax for people like the Yellow Vest. In fact, more fundamentally, um, I want to say that um, you cannot have rule for the people if it's not also by the people. Why is that? Because in the people, you have the source <laughs> of that endless life and unbounded wisdom which the rulers of men must have. This is the beautiful quote I borrow from uh, On the Ruling of Men, an essay uh, published in Dark Water, Voices from Within the Veil by W.E.B. Du Bois, um, the famous civil rights activist and political uh, theorist. And that's, in his view, the real argument for democracy. Um, he continues on with beautiful um, formulas, the vast and wonderful knowledge of this universe is locked in the bosoms of its individual souls. To tap this mighty reservoir of experience, knowledge, beauty, love, and indeed we must appeal not to the few, not to some souls, but to all. So the idea is that you only get the full wisdom of the people when you actually bring them to, to the decision-making process. And conversely, when you exclude people from representation and from decision-making power, you're losing wisdom. You're very likely to lose wisdom. In other words, even rule by the most virtuous few might not result in rule for the people. And that's why we need um, a true democracy, authentic rule by the people, and not just of the people and for the people. Now, let me turn to the vision for democracy that I propose. So if we take this idea of rule by the people seriously, what does it mean? To me, it means that everyone has an equal chance of accessing the center of power. It's not a direct form of rule in the sense of all of us together at the exact same time, making all the decisions all the time. No, it means that most of the time we'll have to take charge. We'll have to in my words, represent and be represented in turn. Sort of update on the Aristotelian formula, ruling and being ruled in turn. Sure, we can have mass moments of um, decision making, like in referenda, for example, which are still very much a part of, of what open democracy is about. But when it comes to the ordinary work, the, the, the regular work of ordinary legislation, this will not be uh, feasible en masse. We'll have to delegate some tasks and we'll have to delegate it to authentically democratic representatives. Note that it's not a mixed regime either, um, this idea of an open democracy, because in, in it, legislative power determines the nature of the rule and it's supposed to um, uh, um, be what uh, the executive and the, and the judiciary are subordinated to, right? So you wouldn't have in an open democracy the sort of personality cult developed around presidents in the US, whether on the left or on the right, nor would you have the personality cults you get uh, also in the US uh, towards Supreme Justices, for example. So open democracy to me is for now, of course, uh, uh, an ideal. It's not yet in existence. But it's more than an ideal, it's also a call to arm in a way. When I say open democracy, I mean it um, in the sense of open the gates, open the door, open the windows, let the people in the place of representation, the place of power. So how do I um, define open democracy in the most possible, in the most possible uh, concise way? I define it as a new paradigm of democracy that takes seriously the ideal of popular rule as ruled by the people and recovers the openness of earlier democratic practices. So I talked about um, uh, the ancient uh, Greece, but also the Viking parliament. One could think also of the Gram Sabhas in India, 
or um, participatory budgeting in, in Brazil, actually. Uh, all of these moments where people can actually access power. Um, but in a way that's compatible with uh, feasibility constraints and so occasionally it would have to be something that's done in turn. So let me talk about the principles of open democracy. So open democracy, at least at the nation state level, which is uh, the level at which I've, I've sort of developed it the most at this point, has five principles. You could have many, this is an arbitrary number. I've tried to compress this, the principle as much as possible so that it's, it's a sort of manageable um, uh, number. And I've done that in relation to um, the principles of, of representative democracy, which are uh, obviously around uh, public discussion and, and periodic elections and things like that. So what are these principles? They are participation rights first, deliberation second, the majoritarian principle third, democratic representation fourth, and finally transparency. Let me say a word about each of these principles. What are participation rights? Well, it's not just voting rights and the classical uh, liberal rights that we you know, are familiar with, like the rights of association, um, uh, freedom of religion, or, or, or freedom of thought, or all these rights that allow individuals to express themselves freely in the public sphere. It's really about grabbing uh, opportunities to make one's voice heard in the place of decision-making power. So among these new participation rights that I add to the established list are citizens' initiatives. So citizens' initiatives are, for example, when 2% of the population can present an issue to parliament, which parliament is free to ignore, because it's not that many people, and 10% can present a bill to parliament, which parliament can either accept or make a counter proposal to. So 2% can only present an issue to parliament, that may make a difference or not, but up to, uh, uh, when you reach a certain threshold, then Parliament has to act on it. Uh, what's a right of referral? A right of referral is when people are not happy with an existing law and they can, when they reach a sufficient number of signatures, let's say 10% of, of the voters, they can demand a referendum on any bill that's been passed by Parliament within three months of its passage. Uh, in some cases, people make exceptions for the budget, for example, um, this is all to be defined. Finally, citizens' initiative referendums are what the universities in France have been uh, crying out for for many years at this point. They want the possibility to initiate a referendum concerning the proposition or abrogation of laws, the revocation of politicians' mandates, and constitutional amendments. So participation rights are clearly meant to uh, empower people to make decisions directly, so like really in the context of a referendum, this doesn't get much more direct than this, uh, and to set the agenda for the polity in a direct, very direct way. Second principle is deliberation. Uh, it's a central principle of my vision of democracy because I'm a, I remain a Habermasian in the sense that uh, like Habermas, after Habermas, I believe that uh, we owe each other reasons for um, the binding norms and laws that we uh, impose on each other politically. And so uh, there's no legitimate law that hasn't been the result of uh, an exchange of arguments and reasons among uh, free and equal citizens. I also see deliberation as uh, a technology that we have yet to fully master. We don't fully understand the role of rhetoric, the role of emotions. And so it's at the same time that it is a very uh, appealing normative principle, it's also a very practical institutional practice that we need to, to learn to master better. The third uh, principle of open democracy is the majoritarian principle. It's very simple. It seems obvious, you might say, democracy is about majority rule. It's about more than majority rule, certainly. Majority rule by itself is, is not democracy. But at the minimum, it, democracy demands that when there's a disagreement, um, we go by default, unless you know, very good reasons are provided to not follow that rule, we go with what the majority wants. And it's extraordinary how often um, we violate that norm or that rule um, in existing democracies, so-called democracies. 
And when I say majority rule, I'm perfectly open to the idea that we should revise the basic uh, majoritarian rule that we use uh, uh, and, and use instead uh, more subtle versions of it, like um, the majority judgment that uh, um, basically uh, uses a star system or a, a rating sort of uh, uh, system to, to give more uh, subtlety and precision to uh, the people's evaluations of candidates or policy. Now you might say uh, that's dangerous as a reason why we have all kinds of counter-majoritarian um, constraints on people's will. That's why we have uh, uh, bicameralism, uh, Supreme Courts, and, and you know, thresholds, supermajoritarian thresholds, and, and the like. But I think at some point you have to really face um, the question, which is, do we do want a democracy or do you want something else? And, and I think there are internal resources of a genuinely open, deliberative democracy to preserve the individual rights that we should, of course, fundamentally care about uh, and protect them from the tyranny of the majority, which can happen without sacrificing the fundamental democratic commitments we also have. So um, I'll stop here. Um, the fourth principle is probably the more central to, to my interest at the moment. Um, it's this idea of democratic representation by contrast with uh, electoral representation per se. Electoral representation is, again, fundamentally oligarchic. It's, uh, it is accessible only to the connected, the wealthy, the, the alpha types, the, the people with the right charisma and, and um, cognitive skills. Um, democratic representation to me means that anybody can uh, have a chance, the same chance as anyone else, to uh, occupy the status of representative. And so here I distinguish between three contenders for that title, lotocratic representation, self-selected representation, and finally, liquid representation. Um, they all have different claims to being democratic that I explore in, in my book. The more immediately uh, sort of uh, uh, interesting uh, case is that of so-called mini-publics. Um, mini-publics are randomly selected uh, bodies among which you could count citizens' assemblies, deliberative polls, national forums, citizens' juries, uh, the G1000 meetings in, in Belgium as well, and they are meant to be descriptive sample of the larger population. They are not exactly uh, practice following the, the, the principle of one person, one lottery ticket, but to my mind, that would be the ideal. As of now, they are used, um, they, are, they are selected using uh, stratified random sampling, where you make sure that you um, have the right uh, ratio of women to men and, and um, minorities to the rest of the population uh, to match as much as possible the, the, the demographic characteristic of the, of the larger group in your smaller sample. Um, especially as it gets very small. I think those bodies should have a, 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 should be sizable, perhaps in the few hundreds. Now you might say, remind us again, why uh, is that valuable? Why do we care? Well, we care about equality of access to the status of democratic representative. But I also think that we should care about um, descriptive representation, the idea of obtaining a mini symbol of the public for the reasons I mentioned before, which have to do with the fact that if you don't at some point gather that mini sample of the public, you will lose in perspectives and information and ideas. And so Du Bois, again, in, uh, in the same uh, um, uh, essay uh, uh, from Darkwater, explains why uh, women need to uh, be heard and, uh, and, and cannot be represented by men, that no man can basically make decisions on behalf of a woman. And he writes, with the best will and knowledge, no man can know women's wants as well as women themselves. To disenfranchise women is deliberately to turn from knowledge and grope in ignorance. So the idea is not that you know, a man can never represent a woman, but it's just that in general, there, it's much easier for women to speak themselves about what they need and want. And that if you have a descriptive uh, representative sample, then you're sure you're not gonna miss out on the right kind of perspectives and information and expressions of needs. So that's why uh, descriptive representation matters. And that's true for gender, but also for race and, and other um, categories.
self-selected representation in a, is another type of democratic representation that I see some value in because it's um, again this idea that anyone can show up and choose to be uh, speaking on behalf of others, acting on behalf of others. So I'm thinking here of um, things as varied as the Gram Sabhas in India, the um, uh, conference, uh, the, the National Conference of uh, Public Policy in Brazil, but also demonstrations for Black Lives Matter or the Yellow Vest demonstrations um, or the Me Too movement online or even the self-selection process that allowed somebody like Greta Thunberg to speak on behalf of uh, world youth really on issues of climate change. And there are some dangers to self-selected representation for sure. You get a very, very biased sample. So it's kind of like the opposite of descriptive representation. But these groups um, do speak on behalf of legitimate interests and need to be fit in the system somehow. Uh, maybe not in decision-making power, but certainly in the process of um, a deliberation and information that, that precedes it. The third form of democratic representation that I consider in the book, uh, in, my, in my vision of open democracy, is so-called liquid representation. So liquid representation is a sort of mix between uh, direct and so-called representative democracy in the sense that in a liquid democracy, you can either vote directly on an, an issue, say, you, you're your own representative, or you can delegate your vote to anyone you like. So unlike in classic representative democracy where the candidates are chosen for you and you have a very, very limited slate of candidates to choose from. Here you can choose your cousin, you can choose um, a scientist, you can choose a politician, you can choose somebody you admire, somebody you know would be more competent uh, on this particular question than, than you are or somebody you just trust in general. It's, it's a really new uh, idea, this idea of uh, liquid democracy that after which I coined the phrase liquid representation. It's only been tried in uh, some uh, European countries, in Germany, in Sweden, a little bit in Spain, mostly in the context of uh, party decision, internal party decision making. But I like the fact that it democratizes the function of being uh, an elected representative in a way. It means that anyone can be that uh, just on the basis of the trust that other people have um, for them. The fifth principle is the principle of transparency. Transparency to me um, is just the idea that light is the best disinfectant. It's a principle of resistance to closure because any system, even an open democracy system, will have a tendency to degenerate and uh, become opaque, become perhaps secretive, become closed, to limit access. And I think the best way to prevent this closure is to keep it um, full of light, to keep it visible, to keep it under the gaze and the uh, careful watch of, of citizens. Of course, the idea is not that everything should be transparent at all times. Um, there are moments for uh, more intimate and private deliberations in this system, but let's just say that the burden of proof is uh, on people who want to break away from transparency. And it's again compatible with exceptions and distinctions uh, between process and substance. You may know about the process going on, but not on the exact nature of the arguments presented. We may, we may have to distinguish between emergency situations where we don't want the enemy to know about our lawmaking process, for example, and normal times where a lot of, of what's, you know, the, the way the sausage is make, made in, in, uh, in representative institutions should be completely visible and um, accessible to ordinary citizens. <laughs> so these are the five principles of open democracy. Let me now turn to a question that should be on your mind at this point. Okay, you want us to believe that ordinary citizens, whether randomly selected or self-selected or otherwise liquidly sort of uh, chosen, are capable of occupying the center of power, which means are capable of writing the law. Do you have any evidence for this, apart from this old example from, uh, from ancient Athens? Well, um, 
I'll mention uh, first and foremost uh, Iceland. I'm not going to talk much about Iceland because I've talked about it elsewhere. But there is some prior evidence from Iceland uh, where in 2010, um, a group of very ordinary citizens uh, chosen from a pool of non-professional uh, uh, politicians were capable of writing a new social contract for Iceland over a very brief period of four months on the basis of the input of 950 randomly selected citizens that had sort of prepared the set of values and principles that they wanted those 25 to embed in the constitutional text. And they helped themselves as well of the input of uh, online crowds by putting online on, on the special website and on Facebook various drafts of uh, their constitutional proposal, 12 drafts in total. So they got feedback, made some changes, put it again on the internet, listened, made some changes, put it again on the internet. And at the end of the, of the day, they produced this beautiful constitution, which in my view, um, absolutely favorably compares to um, draft proposals made at the same time by experts uh, and was an improvement on the existing constitution and was approved by uh, two thirds of the voting population in a 2012 referendum. To this day, unfortunately, the, the Icelandic parliament has not turned this constitutional proposal into law. But to me, it's very clear that those um, uh, Icelanders have made the demonstration that citizens can write uh, constitutional law. Now, can citizens write ordinary law on complex questions? Because of course, when I present Iceland, there are all kinds of objections to the example, it's too small a country, it's too homogeneous, and on top of that, after all, the constitution is not that hard to write. There are many examples around the world, you just have to pick and choose one and just copy paste and make some changes and, and you're, you're done. Not so hard. Okay, so now let's look at the French Convention on Climate Change. It's a convention of 150 randomly selected citizens that was convened by President Macron on the heels of the great national debate of 2019. Uh, just to make the story very short, you may remember, we had the Yellow Vest movement in 2018, big social protests all around France. Macron launches this deliberative experiment uh, over two months, people talk to each other, there are some regional uh, randomly selected assemblies, online feedback, all kinds of input, 100,000 pages of PDF, et cetera, et cetera. Not clear how to aggregate that mass of information. One thing that came very clearly, uh, that, that became apparent is that people were really concerned about the environment and they were really worried that uh, traditional modes of decision-making were not capable of addressing the emergency that climate change represented. So, Macron decided, uh, also under the pressure of activists in France, to try something quite new in France at the time, at this level um, at, of, of this uh, ambition, this convention on climate change. So he brings in those 150 people from all over France, including the ultramarine territories, to this beautiful Yena Palace um, near Trocadero. It's a gorgeous, brutalist building, and they spend there seven weekends, countless, uh, also on countless webinars, and they were asked to answer the following question. Here was the mandate. How to reduce France's green gas emission by 40% of the 1990 levels by 2030 in a spirit of social justice? It's basically asking uh, ordinary citizens to square a circle because the government itself had failed to um, solve that problem in 2018 with their very uh, simple solution of a ta ca um, carbon tax, right? That was widely rejected because seen as too unfair. So how are they going to do that? Um, Macron had said, look, if you can answer this question, if you offer me policy proposals, law proposals that are sufficiently precise, I'll apply them without filter. That's what he promised, something that was widely discussed in France. I will apply without filter your proposals, either to a parliamentary debate, direct regulation, or a referendum. So it's very exciting. Uh, there was a lot of uh, ambition and, and uh, commitment on the part of the executive towards that convention. 
So here's what they did, um, the schedule, if you want, over the next uh, uh, month. They met in October, um, twice in November, in January, in February, in March, finally in June, where they met again to um, basically vote on their proposals and officially uh, render them to government. A lot happened over those uh, few months. We had uh, many social movements against the pension reform plan. We had a pandemic like the rest of the world. And yet somehow these 150 citizens stayed the course and delivered. So here are some pictures of, of, of the whole uh, thing. I, I, I just had to choose a few. So this is them lining up under the rain to enter and be screened at the, at the door. The post-its on which they wrote their moods, uh, various intervals. This was a very human affair uh, on the whole. Very joyful, very uh, passionate, uh, a very beautiful human uh, story that I unfortunately cannot go into the details of. They met in plenaries, they met in small groups, they had access to over 160 experts that came and gave PowerPoint presentation, lectures, uh, helped them uh, write uh, their proposals in, in the right kind of legalese, considered the impact in terms of green gas uh, emission reductions of their proposals. They also tried not to stay uh, in their own bubble. They, they went out the, the the convention to talk to the larger public. They did their best to um, communicate with the larger public in the media. They used Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. They organized so-called clean apparels, which were moments of uh, conviviality around a glass of wine and, and some dry sausage or something, uh, to talk about the climate and to talk about the work, to vulgarize the work, to keep accessible. They also met with regional officials. They uh, proselytized in all kinds of ways. Um, they even created an association of the 150 at the end to make sure that their uh, group wouldn't really disappear and would continue monitoring what the government is currently doing with our, with our proposals. And they came up in the end with 149 proposals that included things like uh, mandatory um, retrofitting of housing to make them perfectly uh, energy efficient, the creation of a crime of ecocide, um, crime against the environment that, that um, should be made constitutional, uh, reduction of speed limits, that was one of the least uh, um, popular proposals, but it was still put forward. All kinds of ideas about uh, banning ads for SUVs, etc. Et um, and there are cons currently being discussed in the public debate, uh, being um, slowly, for some of them, implemented. Uh, it's, it's going on. But to my mind, and for my purpose here, what the French Convention on Climate Change did is really proved that citizens of a large multicultural country can actually write the law on a complex question like climate change. And yes, there were a lot of experts involved in, in, in this exercise. But I do not believe this was, um, uh, if you want, an expert-led exercise. Uh, I think this was not an exercise in co-construction where experts were the equals of the citizens or even their teachers. I, I think that what happened is a real exercise of sovereignty by the citizens who kept the experts where I think they should be, meaning on top and not on top. And so ultimately, the authorship of the proposals that are, you know, perhaps for some of them going to be turned into law by parliament, because of course this cannot happen unless there's currently an approval by parliament. The authorship of those uh, would be laws is actually with the citizens. And so my thinking at this point is that, you know, bringing theory and empirical evidence together, why not give ordinary citizens of this kind more power in existing institutions? And there are, of course, a lot of um, uh, proposals already uh, out there, uh, you know, abolishing senates and replacing them with uh, randomly selected houses of ordinary citizens, so creating bicameralism of new kind, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that that's, that's the right direction. We need to be creative. We need to think in terms of new um, entrenched institutions where ordinary citizens are given actual uh, power, legislative power. So let me briefly conclude. So here is what I think is the central institution of an open democracy. It's what I call the open meaning public. 
So you have so-called autocratic representatives in the middle who are going to make the law and they'll do so by being connected to the larger public through all kinds of methods and they'll be connected to crowdsourced rep uh, self-selected representatives and liquid representatives um, that will operate in participatory budgeting in crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing platforms in great national debate like moments etc etc and you can imagine stacking up such open mini publics so that they cover everyone from the regional level to the national level to the federal level right and to me that would mean that we we, we go from this representative model that's at best um, you know conceptualized as a two-track model where there's clear separation between the people and and the decision makers to a version of democracy that wouldn't be just this that's um this one where you create a, an alternative sphere between track two and track one is for example the great debate you just um, allow people to structure their deliberations better than they would do in the wild but um, you really don't allow them any uh, you don't really give them any say any power so instead of doing that which is the temptation right now just creating complements to ex the existing systems uh, thinking of uh, these new forms of citizen participation as harmoniously supplementary to existing uh, institutions i think we should really be bold and envis envision something a lot more like this meaning a rotation of ordinary people in and out of those places of decision making so that you would have as little of a division between rulers and ruled represented and representatives as possible so i will stop here uh, i hope this wasn't too too much um, and i look very much forward to the conversation obrigado thanks professor allen and thank now, you for having me and well now we have time for two or three questions and I'd like to start asking you and hearing uh, your perspective about the idea of uh, democratic recession. There's an ever increasing number of established democracies around the world facing difficult times and great challenges for their democracies and their institutions. Uh, is the world facing a the democratic recession or is there an exaggeration? Well, it depends what you mean by democracy, right? So if you start from the very minimal definition that we seem to have accepted as going without saying, which is about uh, party democracy and electoral democracy, then we're not really in a recession. We're, we're still um, on an upward trend, I think, uh, since the 70s. We have 57% uh, uh, of existing countries are democracies. Uh, versus 13 percent of the crises. so it's not really a, a recession of, of any large dimension but the reality though is that if you have a more demanding definition of authentic rule by the people then uh, we are in, in a deep crisis and, and indeed there are not that many regimes that would qualify as an as authentic rule by the people in my book so i and i think that also tracks um uh uh, rising uh, expectations in citizens who are no longer happy to to uh, vote every four years and, and and that's it and they expect a lot more of, of an authentic democracy and I think their aspirations match the sort of normative um, uh, proposals that I make in this book open democracy where where I say look it's got to be about um, letting people in letting them have access to to you know, lawmaking functions, um, decision-making uh, positions. So when we see like pop populist and non-populist leaders uh, inside democracy from within, uh, undermining the trust in, in institutions, uh, would you say we this is part of, of a recession or we say, or would you say there's a threat for democracy, but non not necessarily uh, in this uh, conception, uh, not necessarily a recession. Well, so, so the, the rise of uh, populist slash authoritarian leaders, in my view, is caused by the deficit of democracy we have in existing systems. It, it creates this frustration in the people who are then tempted to shortcut 
and you know take a shortcut and, and go for the solution of, of, of the demagogue who promises them quick and fast solutions against corrupt elites or you know neoliberal establishments so in a way i think these, these are the symptoms of a crisis of a democracy of democracy or the, the symptoms of, of a of a democratic recession as you call it but i should also say that again the fact that executives in the us or in the in brazil have so much power is also a sign that we are not really living in authentic democracies because in my book again an authentic democracy is characterized by the nature of the legislative power and which hands it it is in and also by the subordination of the executive power to the legislative power and also by a lack of personalization of that power so so for example if you take switzerland it's the um opposite extreme of the us or brazil that way do, do you know who the swiss president is no no one knows why because there's not one president there are seven presidents it's a it's a it's a council and they and they take turn to represent the country in uh, you know um foreign meetings and, and conferences international conferences and such so no one really cares about who's who the president is he's just doing his job uh which is to implement the law and execute the law whereas in in very presidential regimes like the brazilian one like the french one as uh, as well and the american one there's a, an extreme cult of personality which i think is profoundly unhealthy and undemocratic and it's not just about trump or bolsonaro it's also about obama or macron it's, it's not a left or right question it's really about the, the this uh, position of being the father of the nation because they're always they're always men uh the the protector the savior that that if a people is grown up enough they don't need such a such a father figure in in the constitution and so i think that that's also a symbol or a symptom that something's prof profoundly wrong with the way we understand democracy today oh thanks uh, uh i'm gonna make you two questions about open democracy Precisely. Mm -hmm. And the first one is about the role of technology. Right. Uh, what's the role of technology uh, for, for the advances needed towards uh, open democracy? And considering that uh, in some countries like Brazil or, or in a region like uh, Latin America, uh, the rates of access to technology and connection are really low. So is it necessary? Uh, to have uh, access to technology and internet uh, for a yeah, open the, so, democracy? So I, I don't think uh, it's necessary. Um, the ancient Greece, Greeks managed to select people randomly using very, uh, uh, not crude, but, but non-technologically uh, dependent methods uh, to, to, to allot uh, you know, a token to, to each person randomly. So you could do that with ping pong balls. I mean, you can imagine all kinds of ways to, at the local level, in villages, to, to distribute power in a random fashion, for example, to recreate what I call an open mini public uh, in ways that are, do not require technologies. Uh, it's, 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 of course, going to be much harder as you get to the higher uh, levels of the polity at the federal level or, or elsewhere. Uh, where it's really convenient to be able to communicate via, for example, uh, you know, uh, Zoom or other other means of um, online communications. Because, for example, uh, the, the French Convention on Climate Change had a number of physical meetings, but it also had a number of, of virtual meetings, which were really convenient. Uh, and also, if you have like uh, ultramarine territories, like like we do, uh, it's very costly to bring in people all the time. So, so having those means is really a plus, but I don't think it's a necessity. Um, oh, okay, thanks. And well, we are living in deeply divided societies, and polarization seems to be increasing as uh, fake news and hate speech is uh, spread. How do you envision an open democracy initiative in a context of strong social polarization, such as the Brazilian or the American societies? Well, I think hopefully uh, political leaders are going to see an open democracy model as a, as a way to uh, solve or attenuate that problem. And I think that's, um, that, that's been observed in, in the many, many cases of mini publics that we are familiar with. At this point, the, the OECD uh, came out with a report that documents 289 cases of such um, deliberative mini publics. And what happens each time is that people from very different um, 
uh, worldviews, uh, different backgrounds, different you know uh, jobs and, and professions and all that come together and and find uh, um, a way to talk to each other and find a middle ground. And so it tends to diminish polarization. Actually, uh, this uh, this setting of, of you know mini publics. So I think that's one way. Um, and the hope is that, of course, this is a mini public, so you don't affect the whole public, but that by multiplying the, the occasions for these uh, random encounters, in a way, by reproducing that at all levels, by having those people spread the word, talk to the media, um, publicize the content of the deliberations, maybe through... I, was always, I always thought that Netflix should do some kind of series on the deliberations taking place in a, in a mini public like that you could turn it into tv reality of a really pedagogical entertaining and useful kind and and you would show that way that this actually works that um you you bring a, a bolsonaro supporter and uh somebody on the left and they actually found find common ground uh under certain conditions so you know that that's the hope that 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 would that's actually the only way to bridge the, this gulf now between uh, uh, parties and, and ideologies. So the, so more participation and more yes. uh, civic engagement would reduce polarization or intolerance. Well, as I said, to the extent that, you know, I'm not sure I'm, I, I, this is the only problem. I think uh, democracies are under a lot of pressure, you know, pressure of globalization, technological changes and all that. So it won't solve everything. But to the extent that some of the problems are caused by the representative dysfunction of the existing systems, in my view, including more people, letting people in will take off some of the pressure. I, I mean, we've already seen it. I, it's, it's, it's a fact at this point. In France, the, the, the yellow vest, uh, protested the fact that they were not seen in the French system. And uh, in response, Macron organized this big debate, which wasn't so inclusive of the, of the Yellow Vest, actually, uh, sociologically speaking, but at least um, let people vent for, for, for two months. For two months, you had people able to vent, express themselves. And I think it took off some of the pressure and it's, it gained, strategically, it was a good move. It gained uh, President Macron time to think about the next step. But it also genuinely help society to 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 move forward and and um it, you know it was therapeutic in some ways and then you had the convention which is supposed to institutionalize this further so yeah uh, i think that's that's the right path well thanks and uh, we are running out of time here but uh, i would like to well, and I would like to mention one last thing. I think in Brazil, you're doing very exciting things. So I, I was just informed that you have this um, uh, NGO called uh, Delibera Brazil, who's doing uh, great experiments with mini publics, um, uh, tasks with basically uh, deciding about budgetary issues or solving the problem of solid waste or uh, different, different really important questions in, in, um, in various parts of Brazil. And so I think that actually... Brazil has long been a, a, a site and a precursor in, in participatory democratic innovations. And now it seems you've taken the, the sortition corner as well. So I look very much forward to, to seeing more things come out of your beautiful country. Yes, Delibera Brazil is doing this, this, this great job here with mini, mini publics. Yes. And well, the last question is, in addition to vote or to participating in uh, official institutions uh, what what can we do what can the people do to develop a, a democratic uh, culture and maybe uh, create uh, this open democracy made I think by it, the people i think it starts early it starts in the family it starts in schools uh, it starts in kindergarten uh, you need to you know inculcate this um, listening and, and deliberative ethos in young children, in young men, so that they learn to make room for women, for, you know, uh, weaker, less um, assertive personalities, etc. And then you, you can encourage students to organize their uh, organizations by a random selection rather than election, for example, because we're just reproducing this model of the alpha type who's going to take charge and whose individual qualities are going to carry the group. When I think, in fact, we need to recenter our focus on, on the group itself and the many, many contributions that each of us bring to the group. Uh, and they are not all located in one savior, one person, one charismatic, you know, great leader. It's, it's all of us. We all contribute one piece of, of that collective intelligence. And 
So, so you know, changing the way we um, staff uh, board board you know meetings or or the organization of uh, hospitals, universities, places like that, civil society can 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 start there, for example, and then little by little, I think it could also affect uh, the federal level and the, the sort of uh, organigram of, of larger institutions. So it, it starts at home. Yes, it starts at home. Well, Professor, thank you for your lecture and for taking the time to talk to us today. It was a real pleasure. It was a great honor and uh, I look forward to visiting Brazil some other time again. Yeah, hopefully it will be in, in a better moment for our democracy when you come. Yes, yes hopefully. Thanks. Thank uh, you. E agora, para fechar o nosso evento, a gente tem um painel com o... A gente tem uma palestra, me desculpem, com o professor Boris Fausto. E quem vai conversar com ele é a Roxane. Roxane, professor, bem-vindo.